I am absolutely thrilled to introduce our next panel. As leaders in the United States Senate, Senator Rob Portman and Senator Michael Bennett understand the challenges we are currently facing in a tough political climate. They both have demonstrated leadership and a passion for improving the lives of young adults. We wanted this conversation to be dynamic, bipartisan, and interesting. And we couldn't think of anyone better to moderate than Chuck Todd of Meet the Press. So please join me in welcoming Senator Michael Bennett, Senator Rob Portman, and Chuck Todd. So what we ought to do is we ought to put Senator Bennett on the right I thought I'd and do Senator right. Portman on that. the left. He'd love right? that. Either way. Yeah, just stay up there. You, can, I like you, look, you look good. Is that, you like it up there? Yeah, You're in the minority. Good. You don't get to do that I know, anymore. It's true. Took it away. Is that wrong? Is that too soon? No, no. It hurts. It's okay. <clears throat> Not that we get to do it. Of course, I either. was responsible for it. It's, it's, oh, you take the blame personally. Yeah, well, somebody has. Sorry. Um, let me just do a quick, I, we're, I'm going to just moderate a quick Q&A here, mostly on topic, but you know, it is kind of a busy week in Washington, oh, so no. we ought to make them oh, tell no. us a little something about, see, because I do want to say something about these two senators. If we had 100 senators, and I'm not just saying it because they're sitting next to me, these are sort of, there are, you know, they're the showboats, and then the workhorses. If there are a lot more Michael Bennett's and Rob, uh, and Rob Portman's in the U.S. Senate, I think we would not be facing a DHS shutdown. I think we wouldn't be having this controversy over, um, over Israel right now. I think we would have sort of calmer, reasonable, you know, I, I think part of their problem is they're not loud mouths. You don't do primetime <laughs> cable, come on, yeah. right? Aren't you guys supposed to be yelling at each other and stuff like this? So, our apologies. These guys, are, these guys are going to have civil conversation tonight, um, which is very un Washington these days. Um, so let me just, let's see, I'll, I'll do the, each of you with the, with the awkward question uh, for the two sort of hot topics in Washington. Senator Portman, are you guys going to shut down DHS? <laughs> and then for Senator Bennett, are you going to show up to, to the speech for Prime Minister Netanyahu? Okay. See, the little equal, oppor <laughs> equal opportunity gotcha, and then I'll get into the other stuff. What's going to happen on DHS? Yeah, I think there's a path forward now, and I think it includes both getting a vote on the issue of the president's executive order and getting a, uh, the ability to fund the, the department. Um, I can't predict what's going to happen in the House, though. I think in the Senate, there's a path forward. Why is it that if the leadership wants to do something, it still can't get done? That's what's amazing to me on this story, is that well, there is no elected leader that wants to, that, that wants to do nothing but fund DHS, correct? All the elected leaders in the Republican Party well, and the leadership in the House and Senate. You guys ready for a broader conversation here? <laughs> we will, but um, I mean, no. Let me put it in, in some perspective. I think there's I gotta not go. a... I got to Ben is not going to like this because it, it makes it too complicated. But no, I don't think there's a single member of the House or Senate that wants not to fund DHS. I mean, everybody wants to fund it. The question is... What do you do with this executive order that happened after the election, uh, after the president says, you know, 20 sometimes I can't do it, and people think, you know, because that's part of this bill, they don't want to fund that. But no, if, and by the way, there are more than 60 senators, and I don't know where you are in this mic, but there's more than 60 senators who both think the executive order was the wrong way to go and would like to stop it mm -hmm. and want to fully fund the department. But the way the Senate works with the process, you can't get that vote. I mean, to this point, we haven't even been able to get to the bill to have a discussion on it. Right. And uh, so it's a, it's a little more complicated than just, you know, who's shutting down what. I don't want anything to shut down. Of course, I don't think my colleagues do, but we do feel strongly about this executive order. What's happened in the interim period since this debate started is a judge in Texas says that the executive order is illegal under the Administrative Procedures Act, so he has put out an order saying that it cannot go forward. And so long as that injunction is in place, um, I think it makes it easier to get to a solution say, on the political breathing side. space, right? Yeah. 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 
Premier Netanyahu. The joys of being in the majority. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's oh, what you enjoy filibusters. You guys like and filibusters and now, right? Are you pro filibusters? What? Yeah. <laughs> can I just remind everybody too of what, at least in my view, would be helpful on this issue, which yeah. is that we passed a bipartisan immigration bill out of the Senate with almost 70 votes that dealt with the I think you both voted the for broken it. system that we have. You did vote, okay. But he, you were Rob was a for some of the amendments. Very yep. yeah. helpful yeah. participant in that. Yeah. And that's really what we need to be doing, I think. We do. Uh, exactly. Uh, Are you going to Prime Minister Netanyahu? Agreed. I am going to go. W why would somebody protest going, though? I mean, can't you show up and not clap? I mean, I don't understand why some Democrats are like having working themselves up. Everybody the institution invited them. Why not just sit there and go? Well, I don't. I don't think the way the invitation happened was all that constructive. But you know, the U.S.-Israel relationship is a critical relationship. I don't need to tell anybody here how complicated uh, the Middle East is right now. And uh, I think we've got to find a way to get through this very difficult chapter and into the stuff that really matters here, which is what is the nature of a deal with mm -hmm. Iran going to look like? And, and, and what are we going to do to, to make sure that um, ISIS is contained? That's, let's get through this. Wa Washington, D.C. can make drama out of any, the stupidest yeah. stuff. It is unbelievable how stupid it is. And actually, I'm going to use that to transition here, because you guys, no, you guys have this bipartisan bill you've called the Career, the Career Act, and you've gotten pieces of it passed, but you introduced it two Congresses in a row. Mm -hmm. And it seems, you read the bill, it seems like a no-brainer. It doesn't seem that controversial. You guys are putting on uh, this big event here, that, you know, this, no, none of what you guys are calling for. Why was it so hard to get? And uh, first of all, which one of you wants to describe your bill? I'm going to let Rob. Okay, if you want to give I'll the give the now I'm in the some majority. Notes. But but why no, is it no, that? I'm why why is it so hard to get something as non-controversial as this done? Yeah. In Congress. Today? Good good question. Well, first of all, uh, this was a bipartisan effort from the start. So my my partner in this, uh, Senator Bennett, uh, I'll let him speak for himself. Actually, I won't. I'll speak for him. Um, I mean, he, he took some heat because there's some things in here that, that some folks don't like. By the way, Opportunity Nation stuck with us from the start. We were able to get a lot of this enacted as part of the WIOA uh, reauthorization last year. Thank you. Thank you. you guys were great. Um, so we got, as I look at it, and Mike, maybe you think it's a little less or more, I think about half of it got enacted into law last yeah. year. We've got about half of it left to do. And it, it, was, it was done in the process of reauthorizing what used to be called WIA, you know, the Workforce Investment Act. Now it's the Workforce Investment Opportunity Act, probably thanks to Opportunity Nation, um, <laughs> and that's good. But I, you know, there's a provision there, for instance, that says, look, you got 46 programs for worker retraining spread over eight or nine departments and agencies, only five of which, according to the uh, Government Accounting Office, have any kind of performance <laughs> measures. So we said, let's do a program that at least on a pilot basis puts performance measures in place. Now most of us as taxpayers would think that probably makes sense when you're spending $18 billion in these programs. But, you know, Senator Bennett, it was controversial uh, with some folks who, um, you know, he had to take on and say, no, look, we're, we're not trying to say that you shouldn't get this funding. We're saying that there has to be some accountability here. And, and there were some other provisions that sort of shook up the way some of the dollars are distributed and this connection between workers and jobs, you know, kind of a fundamental thing, like you want the private sector to be involved to say this is an actual need in our community. Well, that was controversial among some folks who are used to getting this money without worrying about having to have that accountability to the private sector. But uh, most of it was, about half of it probably was enacted into law, and we've got more to go. So we look forward to continuing to work with Opportunity Nation and others on that, and some other bills we'll talk about later. So who, who was it that was giving you a hard time? Which constituents? Is this labor? <laughs> it was, I mean, what was it that was making this difficult? Yeah, I mean, pe people that, for whatever reason, because I'm dodging, but <laughs> people, for whatever reason, and I don't have it on TV here, so I can't. Have, I can't have, push a vest, that. have a vested interest in keeping the system the same, and you know that that's holding us back in so on so many dimensions. You know, for me, the the most troubling thing that I can think of domestically is that today in America, uh, if you're born poor, your chances of getting a college degree are nine in a hundred. It's nine in a hundred. Now we can have a debate about what level of government should be doing what, but th those outcomes are completely unacceptable. And as Rob said, we spend all this money in workforce training and nobody, nobody's looking to what the outcomes really are. 
I know what the outcomes are because I've worked at the local level in a mayor's office and then as a superintendent, and I know they're not good. And what Rob and I were not able to do is reinvent the entire system yet. But I do think on there are going to be opportunities, you know, to to transform government so that it actually is aligned to the 21st century, which it is, which it is not. It was designed deep in the last century and the century before that, and it's not responsive to the people that we're trying to serve. And so this is just an example. Another example is a bill I have with Orrin Hatch, who's now chairing the Finance Committee, that's based a little bit on the work we did together, that um, builds on the idea of social impact bonds. I'm sure some of you people are aware of that allows people to um, condense these funding streams, you know, to, um, and not worry so much about s government silos and say we can do a better job holistically serving a population of people. That would be a good thing for us to do too. Now it's not a great description, but it's a, another, uh, you know, creates optionality. Uh, that I think is important because doing it the same old way is not going to produce a different set of results. But, but you know, you brought up, you guys both brought up education in different ways. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring up a, um, I think it's a two, uh, two words that add up to ten letters, but it's a four letter word right now in American politics, and that's Common Core. And I, I bring it up in this respect. Common Core, the whole point of it was you had corporate America was behind it. It was all about getting our education system into the 21st century. You would assume it's about cracking this code, but of course, any time we try to do something that's designed, and I think about what, what, what you folks out here are trying to do, what you guys are trying to do, and you run into sort of the old system issues, and you can't, you can't change these systems, and, and Common Core to me is sort of proof in this. Like here was a, everybody had the right goal, right? You needed, we needed to have better, um, better metrics, we needed to improve STEM education, all of these things, and yet now it's, it seems as if education reform is impossible to happen, and of course, you're still going to have this youth unemployment issue if you, we don't fix our education system. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think there's a distinction between what a local community wants to do, what a state wants to do, and what the federal government wants to do. And part of the concern on Common Core is it's, it's, there's a concern about the federal school board sort of approach because there are incentives coming from the federal mm -hmm. government, and people are nervous about that for good reason. I'll tell you, you know, this issue of what do we do for young people and opportunity is a broad one, and I think Senator Bennett raised a really good issue about poverty and sort of people feeling almost like their destiny is set too soon in life rather than up upward mobility, which has always characterized our, our, our country and, and distinguished us. Um, but the, the 21st century issue is really interesting too because the big gap right now we have is skills training. You think about it, there are um, high levels of unemployment, more than twice unemployment for uh, 18 to 24 year olds than there is for the rest of the, the, rest of the country. It's about 16% now, um, so it's even more than twice. You have um, more than twice as many people today who are either underemployed or unemployed in that age group as, let's say, 2000. So there's, there's a real problem. And yet you have 4 million jobs open in America. In Ohio, we have 140,000 jobs on the Ohio Means Jobs website tonight. You can go look at it. 140,000 jobs are open. And if you look at these jobs, most of them require a certain level of skill. I'm not talking about being a lawyer, I'm talking about a skill, manufacturing skills, bioscience, uh, the new one that I just learned about uh, recently back home is coding. Um, and you can go to school for a few months and learn how to be a coder and you can get a really good job in Ohio right now. And you can do that with a high school degree, by the way. Well, where should that so, begin, I guess? Should we well, begin I, those I apprenticeships think, in high school? Yes, should we begin absolutely. Them? I think we need to look at this whole issue of what used to be called vocational, now called career and technical education, and again, Senator Bennett and I have worked on this a lot. Senator Kane and I started a caucus on this. We've introduced two bills on it. Opportunity Nation, thank you, supporting them. But it's to say, let's take the Perkins money and redesign it so that we're really holding up career and technical education for 11th, 12th graders, but also for community colleges and really giving these young people the opportunity. And part of this is just letting parents know this is a really good track. For a lot of kids. I was just going to say, is it a stigma issue? I feel there's, like there's still Votech, stigma. There's, that still there's stigma. this idea that, geez, if you, and you know, people say nobody wants the German model, right? Where the German yeah. system in sixth grade, we will decide right. yeah. whether no, you know you are a technical person or, a, or, or right. not. But what a you know, great how opportunity! Do you, how do you right now for young take people. away that stigma? So a couple couple things here. One, there's a reason why there's that stigma, and it's because we had a history in this country of dumping kids into programs that. Um, 
uh, and away from academic programs because they weren't performing in the academic programs. If you've got voc you know, uh, technical education that's actually very rigorous and at a high standard, I think we can recapture uh, the high ground there and, and the need is clear. And it's also yeah. clear that you know, with college getting more and more and more expensive, which is a whole other issue that we need to deal right. with in this country, that pe there are people that are going to want a more incremental approach to what they do north of high school. We know that you cannot, you're going to have a tough time succeeding in this economy uh, if you don't have something north of high school. And no matter what anybody tells you about, everybody doesn't have to go to college. It's simply true. But I want to go back a little bit and say that I think this starts much earlier than that. I mean, this starts with the fact that kids that are poor in this country ha have heard 30 million fewer words before they get to kindergarten. And we don't have a means of addressing that. You know, we, 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 if we were treating our kids as if they were our own kids, we'd want them to go to a rigorous school K to 12. For a lot of kids living in this country, their community school is not that school. There's not a school a mile or five miles away that meets that test. And we'd want them to have access to the kinds of stuff Rob was talking about as well as, as higher ed. We've got a crisis here that we are not paying attention to. When you're a kid in the United States and you're poor, your, 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 your chances of reading at grade level in the fourth grade are, are 20%. 20%. And it all goes downhill from there. When I am in a room and somebody's saying, you're a Bolshevik, you're a socialist, we hate the common core, to answer mm -hmm. your question, yeah. what I say to them is, I've got three daughters in, that are students in the Denver Public Schools, which I do. And uh, if you are prepared to come propose a set of standards that's more rigorous than the set of standards they're being educated to, I'm all ears. I'm all ears. I'm happy to do that. But if you're not going to propose, and it's a local level decision, it's not a national decision, but if you're, all you're going to do is take my kid's standards away and not replace it with anything rigorous, I'm not interested in that proposition. And that's, that's i finished with one, can I tell you one more story? Or you, one mm -hmm. more story? I, I, I don't was have with, to go to break. I was with somebody. I was with some. This is how the politics of this has changed. I was with somebody who was one of the people that wrote uh, "No Child Left Behind" not that long ago. The the old the version. And there's tons in there to hate. There's a lot we got to change. But there's a fast. There's a section that's dedicated to the advanced placement exams, advanced placement tests. And you can just imagine. I can imagine Margaret Spellings, George Bush, Ted Kennedy, all saying. We are going to make sure these rigorous programs are what our children you know, have and our poor kids. And we're going to pay for these tests as well. You know, I can see it. I can hear them doing it. This summer, the Jefferson County School Board, which is just west of Denver, spent the entire summer trying to get rid of uh, AP US history in their school district because they believed it was insufficiently patriotic and focused too much on protests. That's how much the world has changed. Now, the parents who desperately want their children to go to college and succeed push back on that, and, and they've had to relent on the fight. But it gives you a sense of how things have, sort of kind of the revolutions that have happened. Well, and it goes to something else so that is, um, it seems as if it's easier than ever to kill something, right? We all know this. It's easier, we now have a, a political system, a political media, I'm not going to pretend the media isn't a part of this, that can take an idea and tear it apart. And, and nobody says, well, what are the parts of the idea we like? Let's just do that. How do we change that reward yeah, it's, structure? It's, it's true. Uh, and it is easier to kill something than to create something in Washington, D.C. But, but let me, if I could, go back to this education issue and, and give you an example of why it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, so Senator Kane and I started this caucus on career and technical. There were two of us. Now there are 17 of us. Uh, we've had a couple of conferences on it in Washington. Members are starting to show up. Staff are starting to show up. It's totally bipartisan. People were saying, well, why weren't we doing this before? So there are some ideas out there you can, you can mine. And I'm not suggesting that we should ignore the tougher issues, but uh, because maybe current technical education seems relatively easy. But I think it does address very directly this problem. Not, I, 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 I hear entirely what Senator Bennett's saying about ensuring that even in preschool level, you, know, you have kids who are ready to learn and so on. You have to have that. But we have this gap right now. It's hurting our economy. Companies can't find workers, therefore they're moving operations elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have a trained workforce here in this global economy, you're not going to stay here, right. whether it's Ohio or Colorado right. 
or here, here in DC. And second, you've got these young people who believe that their opportunities are limited because they are. You know, you've got people who are underemployed. I sort of statistic today uh, that 50% of young people getting out of school now do not have a job, this is college graduates, that requires a college degree. Uh, and maybe that's okay, because you start off waiting tables or something to find that degree. But this is not the way it should be and used to be. Even, again, back in 2000, that was, that was not the case. So I'll give you one quick story on career and technical. So I am at uh, Great Oaks uh, Center, which is outside of uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, and it's a career and technical school. Um, a lot of the kids that go there are high school kids. Some are older who have come, come back to school. Uh, meeting with the administrators, with the teachers, with the, you know, the small businesses who are there saying, we love these internship programs, these apprenticeship programs, like the German mm -hmm. model. But most fun was talking to these young people. There were three of them there. Two of them had uh, been through the program. We're about to graduate. One was just getting in. They're both going on as 18-year-olds <laughs> to get jobs paying 50,000 bucks a year, operating million-dollar machines. Uh, this is in the aerospace industry, aerospace suppliers to GE aircraft engine. And um, really pumped up because during this process, they got college degrees too. Both of them got, got credits equivalent of two college courses because there's a community college in the area willing to work with them. That's what we should be encouraging. And I asked them, I said, well, are you going to go back to your high school and talk about this? Because you've got other, other classmates who are going on to college. We're going to end up with, on average now, $28,000 in student debt. This 50% figure I talked about getting out of school, 16% un unemployment. And, and you're, in, the, in that time period, going to make, you know, 250, 300,000 bucks with good benefits. They said, yeah, we're, we're going to go back and talk to them. And by the way, both of them may go back to school. One wants to be an engineer, but he's going to get a great start. And so I think there's some things like that, Chuck, where it's actually not as hard as it seems. There's Perkins money out there. We've got to redirect it, make sure there are rigorous standards, as Senator Bennett said, make sure we're encouraging young people to take advantage of that. There's a poll out recently, CNN poll, you may have seen it. You know, you've heard a lot of polls about people saying, gosh, my kids aren't going to be as well off as I was. This is about the kids themselves. Do you think you're going to be as well off as your parents? 63% said no. And I would tell you, those and their two parents young went men. Through the Great Recession. Let's those parents went through the Great Recession. Yeah. yeah. But those two young people I was with that day, their answer is yes. They're going to be better off. They know they're going to be better off. And they're, and they're pumped up about it. So I think there's some opportunities here for us to do some things that are nonpartisan where we can make progress. And that's why I like this group. You know, you brought up the college costs thing. And I think part of, you, you can't help but wonder if part of this unemployment, the youth unemployment, has to do with sort of feeling discouraged about the cost. And I think I read a stat, and I'll, trust me, I, I want to get my facts right, given where I work right now. Um, <laughs> you don't need to do that. No, no, no. You don't need no, no, to no, do no. that in this city. <laughs> oh, in this city. No, yeah. you guys don't need to do it. No, I have to. Do it. Did um, you hear that stat in Iraq, or were you? No. Yeah, I didn't no, no, get no, that no, no, memo. No, no, no. <laughs> but it, I believe it was something like 30 years ago, you could get uh, your first job out of college, your annual salary was more than the four years of tuition. Now it takes something like 15 years, something like a decade so, for somebody to get, earn, to get a job that pays them a salary that is, plus the debt. that is the equivalent. Never mind, I'm not talking about the debt, yeah. but just the equivalent of your college tuition. That just, it, the the sure, rise saw, is ridiculous, and the entry-level jobs don't match. It's unbelievable. I saw some numbers this weekend. University of Pennsylvania just put out something, I think, with Pew on this. And I'll get, I'll get these slightly wrong, but they're directionally right. Um, so they're factual. <laughs> uh, but I believe Stephen Colbert calls it truthy. Truth, they're they're truthy. truthy. But in, during the, if you look at 2012, um, if you look at 2012 and you uh, consider people from the bottom quartile of income earners, the bottom 25% of income earners, if they were sending somebody to college from their family, they were consuming the equivalent of 85% of that year's income to send them to college. If you are in the top quintile, you are consuming the equivalent of 15% of your income to send that kid to college. In 1976, and admittedly this was at the height, but in 1976, the Pell Grants, Pell Grants in this country, covered roughly 76% of what it cost, you know, what the average college tuition costs, to your point. Today it's 22%. So, it, and, and the thing is, this is, this is something I think we're, we should spend some time on too in the discussions in the Senate. You, you think about how 
productive our economy is today and how many fewer people it needs to generate the GDP that we have in, in many ways and how efficient it has become. And the idea that you can buy a television set today, you know, that you don't actually have to get up and go across the room and pull open, as my Polish grandmother used to say, open the TV. You know, you can get a magnificent television which costs less today in nominal dollars, not even real dollars, yeah. nominal dollars, than it would have cost our parents or a bicycle for my kids versus the bike that we bought because of globalization. It's true. But wages, you know, have been essentially flat for the last 15 years, which means you might have three television sets in your house, but you're not feeling confident at all that you're going to be able to afford to send your kid to the public university. Whereas when we were younger, you would, you would, for the reason you said, which is, A, it was a lot cheaper in real dollars than it is today. Your income was probably going up, and, and, um, and, uh, and there was more financial aid as a relative matter. And the final point I'll make is this. Because you'd make a wage in Ohio back then that would allow somebody with only a high school degree to support an entire family, it meant there was somebody at home that could, do, could provide daycare. There was somebody at home who might not have had a college degree but could earn a college degree at the same time because there was someone else supporting them. We are in, you know, considerably worse shape than that in, in many sense. So what can the, all right, what can the feds do about this? Because this issue of college tuition, I don't, I mean, look, I, I've always thought universities weren't held more accountable for taking advantage of easy credit. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm sorry, I've got a cousin who double mortgaged to send kids to college because it was easy to get, it was easy yeah. to do that. They shouldn't have been able to do that. So, and universities never got punished the way banks got punished. But, I mean, are, are they over, I mean, what, can government do anything about it? Are there any college or university presidents here? No, oh, I know. Oh, I've, I've gotten into, I'll say this, and they get so defensive. They get so defensive. Well, we have to have dorms with individual bathrooms. We're running up against yeah. them. It's like, hey, I've had this our day, you just sort of, right? Everybody shared a shower, and you, yeah. you know. No, now these dorms are like, you know, yeah. they're, uh, they're Hyatt's, or where are we? They're Omni's. Yeah. So, Four Seasons. Yes. Four Seasons. That's only at Georgetown. Yeah. Well, first of all, it, it is part of the middle class squeeze. Do you think about it? I mean, it's healthcare costs. Uh, and, and, and education, those are the two biggest. Yeah. It used to be gas prices, now those are, have uh, been reduced relative to um, where, where they were and relative to what the incomes are doing. Because Senator Bennett's right, I mean, in incomes are flat. They're actually down 8% in the last six years, and half of that reduction was during the so-called recovery. So wages are flat, that goes to productivity, that goes to a whole series of things we had to do, in my, my view, as you know, Chuck, on the growth agenda, mm -hmm. because Washington's not doing what we can and should do on our tax system, our regulatory system, our energy, you know, the way we use energy, the energy efficiency thing I'm pushing, the exports, I mean, infrastructure, product, infrastructure product, productivity is what we need to get wages up. Even in this economy, as I said, again, there are a lot of jobs going wanting. I mean, there are jobs that are technology jobs that do pay well, or coding jobs, as I talked about. So let's at least fill that gap, and then there'll still be a gap uh, in terms of people being able to have the opportunity they want. But the jobs gap, the skills gap, we can address. And again, this group has been terrific at that. But on the college tuition front, I, I agree with you. I, I think it can't just be the federal government saying, let's continue to spend more and more and more and more if tuitions are going up on average twice, three times inflation. And, and some people say, well, they were 10%, now it's only, what, 6%. Well, it's still 6% <laughs> increase. And nobody's wages are going up 6%. No. Yeah, right? no. And they happen in Colorado or Ohio? And, and no, and, yeah. it's, and, it's, and it's already, so there's some interesting examples around the country. I like what Mitch Daniels was doing at Purdue. I don't know if you followed that. I have followed that. He um, is, he's, what we just did in Ohio. Two years without raising tuition, I think. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, and, and he's also going to every department and saying, find some savings. So uh, there's a, a model in Ohio that we're going to try here. Uh, it was just announced, I think, yesterday, um, which, again, colleges and universities are nervous about this, but it's to say, let's find some savings every year. Mm -hmm and let's keep tuition down. In exchange for that, the state's gonna provide the schools a little more help. So there's a, it's my, my understanding, I don't know the details, is that there'll be some more help for the schools directly from government, particularly to those schools who are achieving these goals of keeping tuition, not just down, but reducing tuitions. And um, I think that's, that's critical because, as Senator Bennett said, I mean, this is about opportunity. People at the high end can afford it, People at the low end um, uh, sometimes can get enough Pell Grants along with scholarships, along with guaranteed student loans to make it. There's this big group in the middle that are just unable to afford education and, uh, 
that's one of the aspects of the expenses on the middle class squeeze. Wages flattened down, mm -hmm. expenses up. Uh, my out question, and then we've run out of time. Since we're talking about youth unemployment, mandatory national service, or the idea of national, mandatory national service. Where are you guys on that? I think I, I'm going to defer on the mandatory question just because I need more time to think about that. But I think that more opportunities for national service are critically important, not just for young people, but as I was mentioning to you earlier, I think this is a huge missed opportunity with respect to our veterans that are returning. You know, Colorado, just one example, I'm sure Rob's got lots of good ones in Ohio, but Colorado is full of forests that need fire mitigation. And, and, and we have some veterans that have the opportunity to work on, 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 these, on, on these areas, and they love it. The ones that I've met love it. They learn a skill. They're hired on very often by federal agencies after that, that they, you know, where they like to work. They're working in a team. They're outside. You know, they love it. And my view should be, is that every single veteran that would want to come to Colorado and participate in that should have the opportunity to do that. Uh, and young people as well, I think, many more opportunities for service than we have today would be a way of, of building the kinds of skills that Rob Portman has, has worked so hard on um, and that we all need as a country. Look, we've got, we've got, a, we've got a lot of stitching together to do of this country. And, and this income gap that we have is serious. The median family wage stuff that Rob talked about is serious. Our politics are completely idiotic and off the point. The stuff we're doing in this town, I mean, we can, it's such a narrow and small, I mean, like, the idea that it's easy to stop stuff in Washington, absolutely true, I agree with that. The thing that worries me more than that is that we are completely off topic here. I mean, the stuff here is completely decoupled from what people in my town halls want us working on. And a lot of it is Rob Portman's agenda, what he just laid out around energy, around infrastructure, my, I would say around immigration. I'd say around so you can tell, education. By the way, they're both up for re-election, but we're not in the election year. Can you tell? <laughs> they're, both, they're both ready to do ads for each other. Mandatory I'm national a, I'm service. A, I'm, a, I'm a better fan. Where um, are you? Well, first of all, uh, our military is, uh, according to the commanders, the best it's ever been, and it's uh, you know it's all voluntary. Mm -hmm. And so this notion that we need to have a draft, I, I have well, some concerns draft. about. You know, na mandatory national services. The idea you pick from anything wouldn't necessarily be oh, no, military. Oh, I, no, I know, I know. But, okay. I, but, but often people say, well, you know, we all had to go to the military and it was great for us. That's what my dad used to always tell me, and, and it was <laughs> great for him. Um, and, you know, I, I, would, I would think that's great for, for a lot of young people. But what the commanders are telling us is, you know, this all-volunteer army actually works, particularly at a time of, you know, the, the budget issues that we have right now. So I think you need to look at other opportunities, and, and there are lots of other ones. There, there's public service like the Peace Corps overseas. There's also public service yeah. uh, like what the uh, National Service Corporation does here. Um, help me here, AmeriCorps. Teach for America. Teach for America and so on. And um, I'm just not sure it should be mandatory. I think there should be more openings, more opportunities. And here's, here's a number that really concerned me when I saw it out of the material that you all sent me before I came here this evening. It was that over five million kids between the ages of 18 and 24 are either out of school or out of work. In other words, they're dropping out of school or, um, or out of work. The number that my staff gave me was 6.5 million because they included people who are underemployed. Um, but there's a huge opportunity for Opportunity Nation. So it's, it's an opportunity to the employers in America who say, we, we, we need a, a workforce. Uh, whether it's starting as an apprenticeship or the internships we talked about, uh, the CT things, things we, we talked about, uh, it's certainly a great opportunity for those young people to go into national service if they cannot find a job in the private sector. But we have to address this. I mean, this is a group of young people who also will soon be, um, you know, into their mid-20s, and they'll be into their 30s. Right. And, and these are people that will become, uh, many of whom will become dependent on government, many of whom will not be able to achieve you know, their God-given abilities, and some of whom will turn to a life of crime, and which is a whole other issue, the whole second chance issue and prison reform we ought to be focused on. But it is really frightening. And so, again, I thank you all for being here. I, I thank Opportunity Nation for what you do to focus on these young people. Um, national service can be part of it, but I think we've talked about five or six other things here. There's no one s silver bullet, but there are lots of things that can and should be done, and it's an really important work. So 
Godspeed in the good work you're doing. I hope you guys got an idea of why I, I really believe if we had 98 other guys like these two. It wouldn't matter who was, which party was in charge. I think it shows you swing state senators, most of them, right? <laughs> swing state senators, they're, uh, they're more rational. Yeah. Thank you Thank both. You.